Renee Harrison, what up? Founder of Black Girls Do Theater, good Ooh. friend of mine from the Flea Theater, which we'll awesome. get, which we'll talk about. I didn't even know you were a creator of anything besides like acting and your performances. And then I came across this page and I was like, that's Renee. <laughs> I know Renee. <laughs> so amazing. <laughs> and I fell in love with everything I was seeing, your uh, live sessions and all these talks your memory, memory, your old content from the 80s and shit. I've also stumbled upon your page. Um, uh, didn't know you before, but like, I was just like, this is like excellent that we've got, you know, this sort of representation and someone pushing these, um, you know, this info that like a lot of people don't know about. I love that your content and it started to spark about the content that I'm creating, right? It Theater content doesn't have to be just like, it, I think memes and like all sorts of things come a long way, but like actually beginning dialogues and conversations, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, that's a really important responsibility that we kind of have the power of at this age to have like our phones in our hands and uh, shape that narrative. So talk about founding Black Girls Do Theater and shaping that narrative. Yes. So thank you, first of all. I receive all of that grace and good love. I'm so grateful to be here. I love you, Keith. I, think you're I love you, Mariah, and I just met you. I love you too, girl. I'm Renee Harrison, actor and founder of Black Girls Do Theater. Black Girls Do Theater is a curation of culture and resources for the Black woman identifying theater artist. And it's so funny because it started, um, whenever I tell this story, I always mention the fact that it started as like a bit of a selfish pursuit, which I think a lot of good things start that way. Um, some things like missing in your life and you're like, I want to create this thing. And then it ends up being this, um, in, in the quest for community, you end up building um, another space where everyone can thrive. And so I was in my undergrad at the new school for drama. We were doing The Winter's Tale by Shakespeare. And I was one of two women of color, the only black woman, the other young woman was um, Latinx. And then one of three actors of color in the play. And I remember sitting in tech. <laughs> I remember sitting in tech. And one of the guys dabbed on stage, like, you know, the, uh, and it was just a moment for me. I was like, no, no, I was like, no, 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 no. It's not the fact that, you know, he did it. It's more so, wow, if, if he was a black actor, that would not have been acceptable. Number one. Um, and number two, a black actor likely wouldn't have done that. Um, so it was from there that I began thinking about, okay, where do I go when I want to have a conversation about like, hey, how, how do you maneuver through like predominantly white spaces as um, an early career artist, as an artist, as a black woman artist, like all of the intersections of my identity. Um, and so Black Rose Do Theater was sort of founded from that. And it's grown into, I think a very magical place, like talking about like the dialogue. We were having a conversation the other day about the spelling of theater. Um, so I, was so, I was so surprised at the engagement on that because I was like, this is one of the, uh, one of our Black Rose Do Theater family members slid into my DM and she was like, hey, do you spell theater wrong on purpose? And I said, oh. Oh. I'm like, <laughs> I was like, um, no, it was intentional. Um, out of here, I only realized it like four years ago, right? No. So I'm late to the game. I only realized that being a lefty, I'm a lefty and that's a weird thing. <laughs> I thought everybody said that like, oh, you're a lefty, as in you're a righty. I'm like, yes, these are facts. Why does it matter? I've always, I've always wondered like why that's important, but it never occurred to me. So let me get this right. R E is the form, right? E R is the space. Mm. No, here is the here is the thing, right? So we went to this conversation with one of our Black Rose Theater fam, even though she sort of came at me. I was like, oh, okay, I. <laughs> so much. Okay, it's okay. I get it. I know it's a touchy. Right. So, did you do it wrong on purpose? That's why right. I love it. <laughs> I have to like play that back in my head. <sighs> For the like the first Wild. week after we had that conversation in my DM, I was I I was like, did she just come at me? I'm I'm like creating a graphic. Like, did she come at me? 
I'm confused. <laughs> but the difference is really super minimal. Um, the ER spelling is more specific to America as a country. Mm. And the RE spelling is specifically for like the European country, specifically England. And so the only reason, like legit, the only reason why the RE spelling was changed to ER was because, you know, after the revolution, America really wanted to separate itself from its like British history. Yeah, and so yeah. they had to change the spelling of names. So like center, C-E-N-T-R-E in America is C-E-N-T-E-R. It's just oh, that yeah. here because like, because the, um, RE spelling existed for so so long people are more um more more geared towards spelling it in the traditional more formal sense but then that also because another conversation about like hierarchies and like the elitism mm -hmm. of theater and it's just a whole thing but that's that's the biggest thing <laughs> yeah I can like totally appreciate that I mean like I've always um sometimes I will it'll be interchangeable for me, like, uh, not necessarily with theater, but yeah, well, actually, yeah, with theater and, like, with other uh, formerly, like, like British words that we've changed to kind of, I guess, also fit our, our accent, uh, the way that we pronounce theater, theater is theater, and then, like, yeah, <laughs> and then, like, for a British person, it's literally theater, and, like, yeah. it's completely, it, it's, that's how it's spelled, you know, and so like um, I definitely see uh, you know a change like the accent uh, factor coming into it, and then um, you know you have other words of course that kind of completely change when you put it in the American vernacular. Um, yeah. I can't think of any right now, which is bothering me so much. <laughs> no, but legit, it's like it, there we can use it interchangeably here in yeah. England. They're never going to spell it with the ER spelling. It, they're probably going to look at you like it is the most blasphemous, blasphemous thing you have ever said. If you go over there spelling it with the ER, but yeah, Keith, it's too. used interchangeably. <laughs> and like, you know, for some people, Keith, like how you mentioned, some people prefer to use ER for the actual like physical venue and mm. RE for the art form, but really whichever one you choose when talking about the art form, you aren't incorrect. Sure. There's all these different, hierarchical conversations going on right now like really? what's even all this could have been done if colonialism never happened but that's another... it's Which true we, can it... have. we definitely can have. <laughs> we we have we have uh we have 10 months um <laughs> now the other thing i wanted to ask you about is these live sessions that you've started doing right so you've been communicating with people who are marketing administrators for theaters with actors and talk about because I have a fair amount of experience like being new to like talking and being sound when I talk and forming my thoughts quickly and I want to know what you've learned from doing that kind of stuff especially at this moment. Mm, I've learned number one that Instagram live makes me sweat um, it makes me really nervous um, mm -hmm. just because of the the live portion of it and then it's like live and then it's digital and so like you working with electronics and what no who knows what can go wrong Ooh. but um these live sessions really began i was at home um i was talking to the black rosie theater editorial intern tiara starks and she was saying that her sister had been doing something very similar to adapt to the covid 19 quarantine and it had been on my mind for some time to really begin to like engage a little bit more deeply beyond like posting an archival photo here or you know posting a, an ad a marketing ad for a production that's going on and so we started the black girls who theater live session um it was literally created because i wanted to have like actual conversation and i wanted to engage with artists who who are doing the work without necessarily having the like the the public face of it, you know, like Brittany right. Samuel, she works in marketing at the Signature Theater. That's my homegirl. Like, I love mm -hmm. her. Um, I want to talk to her about marketing. I've consulted her so many times when it comes to marketing for Black Girls Who Theater. Um, Binta F. Barry, she was, oh my gosh, I was scrolling through LinkedIn and I'm like, I want to find a Black woman casting director, a young Black woman casting director. And I'm scrolling through LinkedIn and there she goes. And it's like, I want to hear what she has to say she's in the room where it happens right she's she's the one who's like a part of the conversation when it comes to the larger decision and so um yeah i learned a lot about the industry 
Um, I've learned a lot about public speaking in the process. Mm -hmm. um, I didn't want to use that word, but that's exactly kind of what it is. Because yeah. it's not middle school anymore where it's like <laughs> tarantulas have eight legs. <laughs> nah, you got to keep those eyes up. You got to keep yep. talking. You can't make, yeah. everything. You have to have like everything a week before looking like, okay, like this is her information. Like I know where she worked. I know like, so in preparation, I learned a lot about preparation while doing the live session on um, preparation mm -hmm. as myself, Renee, like mm -hmm. how do I better um, prepare for this new medium? Cause this is what we're going to yeah. probably be doing for the next six to eight months. And you know what? I think it's a really good thing. I think it's a really good I'm thing because about it. <laughs> I would never have thought twice about doing this like four months ago, but mm -hmm. I have a need to like reach to people, be like, hey, how are you? I've been FaceTiming people for years, <laughs> okay? Like people have yeah, been receiving yeah. <laughs> FaceTimes from me at 11.30 at night, 12.45 at night, 9.30 in the morning. It really doesn't matter. All time is our time. <laughs> Now that is so I don't mind I don't mind at all that there is that we are you know at home that we're you know safely like somewhere that you know uh, uh, where you know you can be controlled in control of like whatever like health you have and and it's just blowing my mind that there's so many people who are like no <laughs> like in the middle of a pandemic <laughs> like straight up are not interested um, uh, in uh, taking any precautions Renee I forgot where did you grow up? I grew up, okay, so I'm originally from Jamaica. <gasps> oh, I live shit. Jamaica, cool. yeah. Okay. Um, so I'm Jamaican. Yes. But I was raised here in New Jersey. So I'm home in Jersey right now, East Orange, East Orange, New Jersey. Hey. And that's where I grew up. Um, I grew up for the first like 14 years of my life, I was between New Jersey and Jamaica. Um, mm. And then once I turned 14, I was up here full time. Um, and then I think last year, we're in 2020 now, right? Yeah. Allegedly. So, yeah. Allegedly. Allegedly. Yeah. Um, yeah. In 2019, I went back to Jamaica for the first time in about like, I want to say like maybe like eight years. So. Wow. Mm. Yeah. That's sick. And when did you catch the theater bug or the acting bug? Who was it? Whose fault was it? Mm, you know, okay, quite long. So I give a lot of props to Disney. I love Raven Simone. And I think the acting bug came from yes. watching Raven. Mm. Yeah, 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 definitely. On like a deep level, I feel you. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, as much as like she has come out and said some really wild stuff and, and since has like <laughs> No, she's a person. Just like Orlando Brown. That's where I got all of my acting. He was no. Orlando Brown is phenomenal. That's actually great that you And that, he's but, um... and he's my role model now. Oh no no no. <laughs> but um uh no, like she said some really cra crazy stuff. She's definitely calmed down since, but like growing up, like she was like everything she was untouchable you couldn't say anything but you still really can't say anything particularly bad about her in so much that like you know she she didn't like really like fall off a deep end per se where where whereas like other folks are like oh all these disney actresses just you know like she i would put her in like you know a hillary duff kind of character category where like mm -hmm kind of always seemed to have a finger on the pulse, great managers, clearly like, you know, obviously it had gone through some BS. It's, it's still the industry that we, we all live in. We already know that it's rad. Um, but with that in mind, to think of their experience, you're like, okay, like these are our, you know, that's what like Raven, it's okay that Raven's a, a role model, you know, for, mm -hmm. because, and, and still can be like in a lot of ways. In a lot of, lot of, lot of ways. Yeah. No, yeah, it was definitely, definitely Raven. for Love acting. That. And then for the theater, it was actually Tyler Perry, right? So Okay. Look, okay. Right? Talk about it. Right. So uh -huh. in my household, in my home, we would have um, the DVDs because he used to film his plays. Mm -hmm. Yes. And we were watching, yes, we'd be watching his plays at home. And I was like, oh, like, that's the way to do it too. So amazing. Um, 
So I, I give it to Tyler Let's talk Perry. about Tyler Perry's play. <laughs> Which you can now catch on BET Plus with a subscription. All of them. They're all there. That's actually pretty amazing. It is pretty decent. I have beef with BET and like, Let's I mean, talk that's about I have beef with the whole industry, realistically. Of course. It's a yeah. bunch of like, you know, white individuals with the power to mm -hmm. um, control these networks that, that are technically like, black you know like yeah. except for like you know tv one and like a couple of the smaller channels but like bet yeah. hasn't been like black owned for like 20 years like and people really don't know that like they see deborah no. and they're it's like, been around for 40 oh, yeah, years black from owned. what it's i understand everyone around deborah mm -hmm. like no <laughs> you know like it, it, she's she's not out here like da, 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 da. and like we can definitely still give her honor while critiquing that Yes, absolutely. very blatant, very disturbing, concerning, I guess, not disturbing, but concerning, uh, uh, you know, uh, topic. Like, that's not. Yeah. Ownership. I want that. And how, like, and how, you know, BET plays as, like, um, a contributor to the media, right? Mm -hmm. like, and it likes it a big one, too. Yeah, exactly. So how, it, it, yes, I do agree that we can honor the work that, like, the people behind BET have done, um, what the channel has done in the past, um, what it is, the good that it is still doing today, while also critiquing the system that it is a part of and how it functions yeah. to aid that system. You can make the exact same argument about Tyler Perry, though, really, because okay. uh, the, the cultural effects that Tyler Perry's work has had on the the BIPOC community as a whole give it so much hope but at the same time so much despair from like the, the caricatures that he creates right. I'm not gonna oh. lie I've been watching the oval <laughs> I'm 23 episodes into the oval and I can't stop watching it and the most uh, because I have a, I have a person I know on it mm -hmm. so I'm not gonna I'm just gonna cut that part out. But the um my my biggest problem with it is that it's so clear that there's only one vantage point that the story is being told from. And he, everybody popularly knows that he he announced he's like, I wrote everything myself. And I knew I knew a douchebag like that in college. And <laughs> like those things don't don't end well for people who like want to do everything. I'm finding myself doing a little bit of that, but I always find like, no, I need to ask for help. I need to have these two producers. No, they don't have to do everything. I'm still fine doing everything, but I need like a team around me. Everybody needs a team, you know? Yeah, I think, um, I, I think that his cultural impact is so strong because it allowed for, um, voices, um, perspectives of varying types of Black people to be seen and to be celebrated, right? Like um, the aunt, you know, the auntie that like would never, would absolutely never be seen on television had it not been for like Tyler Perry writing that into existence. Right. Again, though, with the critique, when you're coming from one perspective, it's like, well, how many black, how many black women did you consult when you were writing this? Right? Like, how I many black women even consult the character? This is the the person that this character is based on. Right. You know, like, exactly. Did they feel seen? And like, was this actually justified? Like this, you know, this uh, uh, depiction was it justified? I, I totally feel that. Yeah. Um, it's yeah. like until you have a conversation where like you were sitting down, engaged and listening and writing down what you hear, all you're gonna be writing about is the is your perspective of the thing that you were seeing. Oh, which is biased, right? Which is right. I was gonna say it was like the story with Tyler Perry is always like, well, I grew up with just me and my mom for a long time and we were homeless and you know, then my mom started working at a salon and that's when that's the, it was it's the salon women that he bases a lot of his characters on. Like a lot <laughs> it's, it's insane um uh and i remember uh you know like and again this is better for worse because i really like i love those plays dearly i still do um yeah, okay. uh, there's, like there's still so much great you know meat there <laughs> like so much the acting the singing yes they who's were doing good that plays. they were good plays exactly good so plays. so yeah. there was 
so like for his plays like you know it's, it's the more recent stuff where I'm just like how did she get on the boat you know like like I don't get you know how acrimony even made like any sense at all but like I don't even uh, remember watching acrimony I what was that um the fever dream saving grace what was it grace something I think that last uh, one with uh, with me right saving grace Disney Tyson was in it um Tiffany Haddish no, Tiffany Haddish wasn't in it. It was Cicely Tyson, Felicia Rashad. Oh, and wow. It was it was so recent. I have to find it. Yeah, I'm literally yeah. Googling it. Also, I went to Cicely L. Tyson School of Performing and Fine Arts in East Orange, New Jersey. Wow, that's yeah. so cool. Wait, I heard what? a great story about Cicely I didn't even Tyson know that on Broadway. <laughs> she was working the, she was doing the gin game with James Earl Jones, and my set design teacher was there like with his team and he said that every rehearsal at the top, she would do like 10 push-ups. And I am inclined to believe him because she said- Oh, like, I think it's, it's Fall From Grace. Like it was way. such a show. Yeah. What'd you say? It's called Fall From Grace, the, sh the, the last movie. It's funny, when I got to Cicely Tyson, I was, I'd gone there for middle school and high school. But when I first went in, the theater program was full. And so I'd auditioned for the theater program, but I actually couldn't be in the theater program. So I played viola for two years before I finally was able to like get into the theater discipline, the theater department. And then, you know, it was so, it's so funny because like she would be walking around the school and that's I think what her was that um, she'd be present. Like it's not, it's not just like the school is her namesake. Like she'd be there. Like walking around like, hi, how's everyone doing? And she's just Miss Cicely Tyson. But I love that. I really love that. It's kind of like how Felicia Rashad is always at my mom's school. Um, like what? What a diva! Like what? Not even an icon. She's an icon. not even a diva because she's super sweet. Like she's so nice. Yeah, my friend Mackie was in Our Lady of One Twenty First Street, which she wow. directed at Signature, and he, he the stories I've heard about her is just she's just like a gem, and she's oh. she's so interdisciplinary too as somebody who's been in the industry for so long and like is still part of some establishment you know what with uh bill cosby and shit and she has to deal with like her reputation but she still manages to like create theater on yes, top of should. all that and that's badass she can't, right like she it's, she can't not her and her sister definitely had a huge influence on, on me as a, as a kid debbie allen um i was you know, it's just such a you're gonna hate me i did not know that debbie allen was the sister of felicia rashad Are there's you... three of them <laughs> it's okay wow <laughs> you just talked about her the other day too funny enough my oh, parents wow. i they're gonna probably punch me when when they get back they're at the beach right now oh. let's talk about the flea Huh? Jeez, we would have let you go to the beach. <laughs> no, I don't want to go to the beach. I it's it's too hot. It's, it's too hot, and I bike. I like biking. That's how I get my tan. Exactly. But let's talk about the fleet, because <laughs> I I haven't released anything where I've I've really talked about it too much. Not not with anybody from the fleet. Mm. Um, this is the first, and God, put me on you know. Tea. I should preface this by saying I'm not a part of the final conversations with with how uh, everything is going to go. And um, yeah, I'm curious to what, since, let's start with your, with entering the flea mm -hmm. and that audition and um, serials and then, yeah. Yeah, I got into the flea in a sort of weird way. So... Um, they were doing the color break season and Sherry Barber was directing one of the plays. Um, I'm forgetting. Friday. Good Friday. Good Friday. Love Good Friday. She was uh, crazy. Were, <laughs> she was directing Good Friday. And it's funny because months prior, um, Sherry taught at the new school. She was one of my professors. Oh, yeah. So God. months prior to... Uh, them starting rehearsal i got an email from one of my peers who had been working under sherry at the cherry at the orchard project um oh, wow. and she was like hey like sherry wants your information can you just like send me your like official email all this info like you know the little things and i'm like oh yeah sure not having any idea about what was going to happen and then a couple months later 
um, I got an email from Emily like, oh, hey, we want to, we want you to come in as like an understudy um, in order for you to do that. However, you're going to need to audition. And so I auditioned for the fleet while Nigel was in England and we were on Skype. It was weird because I, this was like my very first time doing a video audition and doing it through this platform. Um, it was weird and I like saying happy birthday instead of like an actual song <laughs> um, and I did my monologue and then I got in that so yeah that's how I entered the play as an understudy for Good Friday. A bad backup. Excuse me. And when did you make that realization that like oh I could do serials also or when did you like make that choice? I think I might have been in your first serial now that no, I'm were. yeah we were definitely in the in the same serial for the first my first yeah, year it was that superhero one right yeah right before yeah. the mac wellman season began was it the that was gina Femias. yeah the superhero one was the one that had like the wizard of oz thing at the end oh yeah i was right. like toto and yeah. the cowardly lion and yeah. a social media influencer who was somehow yeah. both of those characters. Yeah, it, it was it was fun as fuck. I'm not gonna lie. I took the I wore a fur coat from Sincerity Forever, but it was too small on me. So I, I remember like I stretched the inside, but I didn't tell anybody. But um, <laughs> <laughs> that's the move. Um, no, and then you did Invention of Tragedy, right? Yes, I did do Invention of Tragedy. Yeah, so I'm curious as to how that experience was for you. Um, I enjoyed the invention of tragedy because it was so different from anything that I'd ever done before. Um, Mac Wellm, I I wasn't familiar with Mac Wellman's work. Um, I'm not gonna sit here and say I'm super familiar with it either because I I think that it requires some like patience and studying and time. Um, of which I have maybe two of those. I'm joking. <laughs> <laughs> but, Love that. Love um, <laughs> but yeah, so we did, um, Invention of Tragedy. I, it was a great experience working with all women. Um, I love Megan Finn. I think she is dope. Um, yeah, Megan's dope. Um, I love the way she runs a rehearsal room. I love what she as an artist stands for as an ally stands for and how she contributes to the larger um, black indigenous Hispanic community, right? And like how she curates spaces and allows us to exist fully in those spaces, you know, or not even allows, so I don't even want to give that much power, but like creates a space where we can exist, right? And, and not be like under the constraints of like white supremacy. So. Yeah. Yeah, so the invention of tragedy was cool. It was cool. It was a cool that's, experience. That's dope because I want people to understand like the work that went into being any member of that cast, right? So you had to memorize the script before you came in. There were certain pages where you were all talking uh, the entire text, and it's very stream of consciousness, a lot of it. Very, and very. You, it's like a very dis, it's like if disjointed stream of consciousness consciousness were to make sense like that entire <laughs> sentence that i just said was what the text was if that concept made sense yes no it does it absolutely does it's it was just a continuous sort of like sort of the the way megan framed it sort of a a feminist fairy tale fantasia <laughs> something <laughs> like that Okay. Um, we were like cats and dogs. Um, we had to learn songs. We had to know everyone's parts. Um, and then I was also back back up. It was myself, um, Macy, Chris, and um, Maddie, Maddie, Madeline Rose. She, we were all the bat backups <clears throat> for the three, like, sort of like, standout characters the the ones who step from the chorus yeah um, so it was like okay so yeah you have to know the parts of all of the choruses and then you also have to know the entire second half which is which like consists of song and dance um and also as an understudy knowing the the full like arc and lines of the and swearer and you know all of that Exactly. It was a lot of work, but it was a lot of fun. It was a lot of fun. Um, exhausting, but fun. Right. Yeah. 
Now, we had basically more or less been involved with various things from serials to like a main stage show throughout our time at this place. And then around June 2nd or something like that, a former bat who was my producer, Bryn Carter, who like shout out to Bryn, you're yeah. a badass, you know yeah. this, but she basically sounded off on Black Lives Matter, the statement that the flea made about Black Lives Matter being basically saying, and you know, forgive me if I'm just you know, condensing what she said, but how can you say Black Lives Matter when you're exploiting Black trauma in a season about Color Brave? Look past that and continue to defend the fact that you hardly pay actors. And look, we've both been like, our experiences have, well, I'm sure have been vastly different. What I've mostly learned from this is as as much as the door has been shut for me, it's been slammed on a lot of people there. And I'm not going to sit here and ask you for your experiences with that. But I know that we're part of the solution, right? Yeah. yeah um, it's, I actually, the first time I saw Bryn's message to the flea was through Black Girls Who Theater. Mm. Um, I was literally one day I logged in and people had been like tagging me in the post. And so then it created this like internal conversation about, wow, you are the steward of this community. And like her, her life, her experiences are supremely valid in our space. Um, and then Renee, as a member of this organization, what does that also look like for your relationship to the organization and um, how you interact with them? Because I'm going to believe Bryn. And yeah. that's also going to be based on um, the fact that I'm also a member of the community and like what um, experiences I have had while being at the fleet at present. So, yeah. So um, I, I was in full alignment with everything that she said. Um, it's a, it's, I think it sparked a very important conversation, not only for the fleet community, but for the entire arts community about what hypocrisy looks like and how um, there and how all of these theater companies. Yeah, how all of these theater companies really feed into this narrative of black trauma um, and that being the primary storytelling um, storytelling uh, tool that yeah. is used when talking about black life. It's the um, vessel, it right. seems like. It's, no, yeah, yeah it's, it's fun. Default, you know, you can't have a black character be like a main character without pain and struggle and, and, and rejection and possibly no resolve, honestly, you know, being the narrative, the whole yeah. narrative, that's it. And I think it, that they're aware of that too. Um, they have to be. No, or, yeah, they have to be. because In some sort of like way where like they think they're helping, but. Yeah, no. You're it's like the, missing the, the point. The, the, it's like you're looking through rose-colored glasses. Yes. Realistically, the the producers of these theater companies, the artistic directors, like they know and their board audience. of directors, board of directors, they know their audience, and like, do old white people want to see like black people happy? Like, is that That's is not. that going to sell as much to go see Black Joy on stage when you're looking at if you're eighty something years old? Like, how do you know what that looks ago, like? You couldn't possibly, not. yeah. Yeah. It's, it's crazy to me because we've had these conversations in, I was on one of the subcommittees when we were evaluating solutions. And one of the things that came up is that the artistic director and the producer have to approve, get their, get their season approved by the board of directors at the flea. And they do this presentation of a color brave season for a board that is what half white people with a shit ton of money and what are they going to say to this like BIPOC artistic director and this team that no we have some problems with a color brave season do so you know how bad that looks and it's not just putting them in that position that's the problem the problem is that the material that was sent to the flea was approved and it was put through a filter and they put a, they put a lens on that shit and 
the deepest problem is is that that's how we defined diversity. That's how we define bravery, trauma. Right. Um, the We See You White American Theater movement, We See You What mm-hmm. on Instagram, I was scrolling through their page the other day because they've started posting testimonials. And the one that stood out to me the most, this, um, this playwright had sent their play to this theater company that really touted itself as being um, forward thinking and progressive and diverse. And in the conversation that she was, they, I don't know if it's a male or female or whoever, like, so I'm gonna say they. Um, so they were saying mm-hmm. that in the conversation with the artistic director or with the producer, producing director who was a woman, that the woman said, I don't see myself in this story. And the playwright was a person of color. And she's like, <laughs> um, yeah, like, why would you expect to see yourself in this story? And then they later went on to like, I, I think produce another play that was like more like traumatic and so on and so forth. So, I mean, it's, it kind of sends a message that white folks um, and these, you know, people who are picking and choosing what goes on stage can see themselves in our pain. And that's fucked up. Ooh, I love that. Like, Mm. as you were saying that, I'm just like, so you can see yourself in me being uh, tortured or hung or beaten or raped. That's, you can see yourself in that. That's, that's something you can affirm. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, we go fuck yourself. I mean, analyze yourself. You know, we have a conversation about like generational trauma and yeah. I believe in generational evil and I believe that too. Yes. If you can align with that, if you if you need, you know, mm. trauma in order to uh, another person's trauma in order to align with yourself, you got to do right. some work. You have you have some work to do because yeah. that's very telling it's very very telling well that's why the the rhetoric around allyship in the past month has been so fascinating to see i look back a month ago to like me being on this platform and being like all that remember that week where like all the late night guys were like it's been a crazy week i'm gonna shut up and i'm gonna listen and I'm gonna back away <laughs> and i I'm glad I didn't mostly do that shit, but I, you know, I'm still working on myself and asking myself questions every day. But I think the point of, of allyship is that people don't feel like you're working in front of them to be better for them, right? Isn't that like how any relationship works? It's like, no, don't show me that you're well, you're or even don't working. Tell me. Yeah, don't yeah, you don't need yeah. to make it performative. You don't need yeah. to do the, oh, here are the grand gestures. Look. look <laughs> yeah, this, this is why I'm a little wary of up. the sharing the mic shit. You know what I mean? Some of that is like, here, they have it for a day. Now you get some of my people for day. And not to say that that doesn't do like a fair amount of work, but like, don't show me that you care. <laughs> Fucking care. <laughs> Just do it. Yeah, like, don't put it on, don't make it a whole display necessarily. Like, like did I think that the um, uh, share, your, share the mic platform, uh, like platform exchange program, um, did I think that that was cool? Kind of. Like, I was excited to see, like, some of my faves finally get, you know, on these big platforms where they deserve to be, you know? Like, right. um, uh, but that's the thing. It's like, they deserve to be there. You know, there are, exactly, there are algorithms specifically intended to keep their commentary on, like, the world, keeping their knowledge, their information from being seen by this large of a platform, by see, being seen by this large of a, uh, yeah. the fact that we have to do that is the problem it's not the it's it's not like yay it's done no no like i'm not asking uh, natalie portman to go yell at instagram i'm saying like someone you know needs to be at instagram screaming like why is our algorithm favor white people someone needs to be at tiktok saying what the f-? i mean well tiktok is china um uh and and their ideas about race come from here 
Like it all comes from here. Our soft media is what gave, what gives, you know, uh, uh, credence to uh, anti-black racism in other countries. You know, we shipped that out. Our country did that. <laughs> you know, outsourced like, racism. By key. You know what like, you're, what? Making, you're making me think of like, um, so technology bias, right? Yes. Um, and th like that completely, like Instagram um, uh, censoring our work, our content mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. is uh, is a direct like consequence of technology bias. And it shows up in everyday life, we just don't recognize it. Where like, if you go into the bathroom and you know those like, um, the thingies that you have to put your oh, hand yeah, in the hand. soap. You can't or, see our hands. You can't see your hand because the person who's creating it, who is, who could very well, like if you, who could, no, let me just say it. If you, this 20 some year old white boy in Silicon Valley, um, doesn't think of anyone outside of himself because the technology world is also like full of white supremacist ideals. Um, yeah. You go in, you're trying to get hand sanitizer and it's not working because the technology wasn't programmed to suit your complexion, to acknowledge your complexion, which is why like things like um, the driverless Uber, like that's not going to work that's unless you good. have, mm -hmm. like people are going to die because it's going to be like, okay, if you're, like if you're darker than me, like you're not gonna be seen by Uber. You, mm -hmm. They just don't have the the range of like of perspective to consider um, to consider and then like apply that that perspective to the technology in order to make sure that everyone is going to be safer, that everyone can be serviced in the way that they're supposed to be right. through technology. Same thing with with lighting in the theater, right? Lighting with photography. Lighting we so saw that. Uh, what was it? The Annie fun. Leibovitz. Mm -hmm. picture this Recently. week right yeah, and everybody bio. was like you can't light shit and it's like we should not define standards of how people are illuminated by their complexion i mean when we do it like like we've done this for so long like when you look at the medical field uh, all of the you know standards like you know like the pain scale all of that is based on white men uh-huh so when it, we're in pain, it seems, in, it's ridiculous. It's not, it isn't possible, you know, because there's just been for so long this narrative in healthcare that black women and black people's skin is thicker, <laughs> is thicker and therefore they don't actually feel okay. as much pain as other people. Like, doesn't that just seem fucking sick? Does that not seem <laughs> like, it makes no sense. No, there was, um, and it's everywhere. there was a screenshot yeah, there was a screenshot of um, a medical, like, textbook that they're currently using, that they're currently, yeah, because we're in 2020, mm -hmm. that mm -hmm. they're currently using that breaks down the, like, perceived um, sort of expectation, pain scales. Can you hear me? Can you see me? Yeah. Okay. My thing just said your internet connection is unstable. Good. Um, <laughs> so it, like, broke everything down, and it was saying, like, oh, um people of, um, of Indian background are more likely to be more tolerant of pain because of cultural beliefs of Native American backgrounds that they're, they, that they think that like pain is like, um, is a necessary um, experience in order to get closer to God. And then you see go to black people and it's like, yeah, they, they take pain much, much better or they're able to be more resilient, so on and so forth. And it's like, are you really kidding me? Like. Don't make like, no fucking yeah, sense. Like you, like you read this and you think that, yeah, this totally makes sense. Right, no, it, it's actually everywhere. Like people so don't get it. Like pe people are so ignorant to stuff like this. And I like, I have friends who were, you know, I was really close to folks in, in the medical school at my college. And I've had them tell me like, you know, that they've been taught by professors who believe in, about that shit they've been uh, uh uh you know in class with students who believe stuff like that and they've also been you know uh and this is a service this is a program for black and like brown and like marginalized communities to become doctors and so like once you throw like marginalized communities you know that now you have like that's that's a lot of that's a lot of people now qualified to be in this group and mm -hmm you know, you have situations where you have like the N-word being carved into desks, um, you know, by not black people. You have situations where uh, uh, 
kids who are not black, students who aren't black, are using the N-word and saying really racist stuff in private chats that, you know, were, had been leaked. You have, you know, and these are, this is their space to become the doctor they didn't see growing up. This is, right. for, this is for all of you to, to embrace that and, and for you to go into that space and just be like, like, I'm like, 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 this is charity for those black people. But like, I'm in this program because I'm better because I'm smart or because I like the fact that you can be in the same rooms as me, we can be just going about our lives, you know, and, and, and we're doing the same exact things. But like, there's still like this belief, like this hierarchy, this narrative, that like, I don't belong here, you know, and then on top of that, when you are doctoring people who look like me they don't matter their experience doesn't matter their pain and trauma uh from that pain does not matter like you know i uh, like it's crazy I, yeah yeah no i, I in my own <laughs> local stories yeah yeah we could talk about this for ever because like no uh, we have we do we do <laughs> we, <laughs> we, we go on vibe. we do go off from the show <laughs> It's we true. Get, you know, we get prescribed these things, though, like, and I don't mean just in medical, like, I mean, you know, in, in day to day, like in theater, but back to theater. Mm. Um, uh, lighting. lighting, like, Let that's so simple. Down. Spill. <laughs> Pour the tea. Fucking go. I was doing a production. <laughs> Not going to name any names. But I was was doing it race, production. though? I, I saw you did that on your resume. Oh, no, it wasn't race. Race, I actually had, like, so race I did at the New School for Drama, and I actually had, like, full creative control over that. So race was, like, yeah, it was really dope. Um, We had this thing called Creative Cafe where, like, they'd fund you putting up your own productions, and so. I need to hang out with you. (laughs) Girl, we had to get together after. uh, (laughs) Yes. Um, But we did race. Um, The director, Sophie Parent, whom I love, um, she's non-black, she's white, but she was mm-hmm. like in it. She was like, okay, how do we make sure that we curate a space that like where this conversation about like rape and um, the judicial system can happen. And so, yeah, race was good, but that wasn't the play. I was like, I better look good in this when like I'm the one who want to do this. I want this to be on my resume because Carrie Washington. Yes. I want to period. I want to do Carrie. Carrie. And so, um, no, but with the play, so I was doing another production and um the lighting designer was an older white gentleman probably like in his 70s i want to say yeah Um, he was and he put blue light a very dark blue light on me on the cast and the cast was like predominantly white um and i remember just thinking about how like Beyonce had said like you can't trust anyone who puts blue lights on black girls like you just I can't trust them and so I was sitting there on, I was standing there on stage and I, I could feel the blue light and I'm like I'm not going to show up on camera you're not going to be able to see my features at all on camera when we do this come to find out like you know you watch the video and it's like where where are you um you thought or just just like what I thought but it's funny because like mind you the I feel like I'm gonna just give the whole thing away whatever um (laughs) the artistic director was black and so they came in and they were like we should try to make sure that the lighting suits everyone and so some adjustments were made to like better suit the wide range not the wide range but the range of the cast like we had one Asian woman who was there too and so like the blue light had made her look um like uh, a, a very like yellowish as opposed to whatever he was trying to do with the other actors um but yeah and so that's the thing like I'm those other actors right. were prioritized in that decision you know i uh I, we, we really see it all the time uh like that is <laughs> it's such a big thing and people are like not getting it like like because they're lighting professionals you know they are like taking it like oh my god how dare you i've been doing this for like 80 years and it's like bitch i did not ask you any of that (laughs) you know i'm I'm telling you what it looks like yeah and you are not even using me as a reference to to for it's actually so disheartening it's not a part of their training though right you think a professional though would you know 
or a professional would, would, would want like you know um uh, uh would want to listen but the point so, is that the system is, is the built so that you don't have to learn any more than you, you don't do. have to learn and that's even my like, that's like my beef with like um the hair and makeup too because yeah. you know you hire if you hire a black woman or black man black man makeup artist or hair artist they're going to know how to do everyone's hair on set everyone yeah. but if you were to hire a white woman she's only going to know how to do white girl hair so she's going to look at your hair and be like ah. I, I did mm-hmm. backgrounds i did an extra i was an extra on pose uh like I a few pose. months ago I'm so like i was so happy i was like oh my god i'm <laughs> and i'm like an extra i'm like looking in the, i'm in the shoot section and just like <laughs> like Shannon Mock is over there like I'm flipping out and um uh when we were getting dressed like we were getting ready and they were like trying to find our costumes um and the costume designer you know white lady cool whatever you know she was able to like, like get the 90s look that that we were going for but when it came to hair I had like it was it's basically like I had a wig that's basically like my texture of hair but it was huge like it was really big and so they were like if we're gonna style this we want it to be cute, but you probably don't need a style because it's so big and, and pretty. But if you do need a style, go to her. Like, and this is a white person telling me, you go to this black woman because I'm not gonna tr- attempt to yeah. reimagine what this, you know, like what thank this God, should thank be. Thank God that they haven't had a black woman on. Well, I love that because it's a very diverse um, yeah, backstage like, so. casting. And the, you can tell like yeah. the people in charge are all white, but the, you know, the the yeah like you know, like like she wasn't telling me like you go to her because you know it wasn't just a suggestion it was like that's her job to tell me where to go but um uh but she did have the wherewithal in and of her, like in herself to do it and I, like the truth of the matter is I can't and we can't um and generally trust all white folks to to think like that you know like, and it's 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 very naive to to be like oh like it's fine she can do it. Like she has the perfect. She just talks yeah. about and the way and like, the way white people pass that responsibility yes, has yes, to be yes, 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 yes. recalibrated, right? Because so we can't just be system. trusting me to speak right. for black people as a whole. <laughs> because for every one black person that agrees with me, there's five million that don't. There you go. There you go. You know, That's totally it, fair. It really makes me think about like um, how important it is to have full control or mm. like or to have full control over like or full understanding of um who you need to be in a space right mm-hmm. um and and I think just in the industry itself thinking about how you can fully control your artistry like like what things do you say, say yes and no to as opposed to leaving the control in someone else's oh, yeah. hands and so like even and as a white person doing that, that that makes a huge difference, like culturally, because when a white person says yes to another white person about like, I remember an audition that I went on while I was still at the flea, actually. And I was in this cast of like 27 people with sharing like one little dressing room. And that's a whole other story. We won't go there today. But <laughs> I was in callbacks for this thing that I had like, I tap danced my ass for, I had sang for, and they called me back for like, oh, the description was a white actor playing a Latino character. And the gig paid like $900 a week at like some fucking farm in Ohio or some shit. And these people were just like, well, we're not gonna see anybody for callbacks if you don't put on the accent. And I'm like, oh this is where they get the idea that they could make BIPOC people Mm -hmm. become more urban it starts with the it starts with like that that blackface kind of shit Mm -hmm. that they make people do and ultimately like I did a a, a, my decision was like I had to speak Spanish during it but I just hablo espanol cuando hablo Mm -hmm. A I'm horror, not doing it. <laughs> you know, like I'm not gonna. I, and they were like, "Well, that's not what we're looking for." And I'm like, I right. felt, I felt so either, bad about myself because I was like, "Why that, can't I be what they're looking for?" It's bullshit. I was gonna say, I was like, "Is is the character pretending to be Latino?" No, like, no, but it's a white actor playing a Latino character. 
so that's they're look, the so they're looking for a white person to play a latino person that's yeah. see, that's a problem but like and you're not looking for a, a white person to play a Latin, to play a white person pretending yeah. to be and a it was some person. tya that's issue, a whole other right thing. so you could write it off like it's like imaginative it's for children i'm like no it's for children no, it's, it's for, for children like, that's it the problem be so accurate if it's for children <laughs> Ah. <laughs> oh, but yeah, like, yikes. Yeah. Why do you need a white person to play that role, though? I right. just, I've been need, like, that just blows yeah. me. Like, that was like three years ago. I can't. Like, which is like so, so recent. <laughs> like, like that's, that's, that could have been yesterday. Yeah, yeah. Or actually, it was two. You know? Yeah, eight or nine, maybe seven years ago, that like we had, you know, those uh, white folks putting blackface on to be in hairspray in white plains across town from me. I'm doing hairspray, you know, in, in Irvington, and hair, hairspray is going on in another town somewhere, and they they couldn't find any black people, so they put white like they put blackface in on the white characters, and uh, or they, the white characters. Oh, no one stopped her. She decided to do it like it was the white Mama Maybell. She decided last minute that she was going to throw on blackface and put it on the children as well. So it, for me, it was like, yeah. Yeah, like she put black makeup on the kids and they didn't see her first. They didn't realize that it was her idea. They just saw all these white kids in blackface come out as the motor mouth kids with no idea that what they were doing was going to one, get the play canceled. Like the, play, the whole show got closed that evening right. in the middle of the show because people were walking out like this is fucking racist. And two, they didn't understand what it was that Mama Maybell was doing. She wasn't, right. she didn't pull out a can of tar. She pulled out makeup that you can buy in the store. Right. And like, while I'm sure some of them were like, what the fuck? You know, it's not their responsibility as like 11 year olds, because this is a white things high school or not. Well, no, they're not even children at that point. It was a high school. I got to do some more research on that. Right. So yeah, I feel like they were actually at a, 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 a reckoning where they could have, they probably did know um, that what they were doing with blackface. So, you know, let's not give these children too much, <laughs> you know, these teenagers too much yeah. credit. But like, yeah, like they, this, this happened, um, you know, seven years ago, which again, might as well be yeah. yesterday. So then I, I guess- In regards to that conversation around blackface. Uh, Renee, what change do you want to see in an institution at a time like this? What is like for you, if, if you had to pick like one thing all across the board? Or what, would you do in your institution that you deserve to have? <laughs> the biggest thing for me is accessibility. Mm. Um, accessibility um, because as we've seen over the last four months, it's possible. Accessibility in the theater is very much possible in a way that doesn't suck people dry for all of their money. Um, I want to see the emergence of radio plays again. Like, you know, the public just did one. Um, it was oh, what, yeah. Richard III, they just did that. Yeah, yeah, Prior yeah. to that, um, there was one that was done at Yale Cabaret, Ain't No Dead Thing. And the parsnip ship, right? Is mm -hmm. that what that's called? Oh, no, 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 I'm not sure about the parsnip ship. I only know about Ain't No Dead Thing. That was the one that they'd done, um, in partnership with one of the like black theater groups on the Yale MFA campus. So I want to see more accessibility because we know it's possible. Like there's absolutely no way that we could, that we should go back to the format of, um, of theater where you have to pay four or $500 to like engage with the art when there's a possibility that you can bring the actors into a room and have them record the play for the radio, right? Or for listening purposes. There's also the opportunity for like Zoom conversation. So like how I, I want to see the, um, how I would do it and how I would want the rest of the theater industry to, uh, to like really move forward is to think about how they can engage with communities in this new world that we are living in and doing so intentionally. So that's that's the biggest thing. Absolutely, I love that. Cause I imagine how much theater is now getting to people that wouldn't have gotten to them before because we are, you know, it's just, because we have like a radio show where it's just like, oh, mm -hmm. this is so great, my visually impaired aunt. 
who has never seen me perform, for instance, you know, this is so great for my bedridden family member or for, or you you don't have to be related to these people to care about them. So (laughs) this would be great for just (laughs) this community who doesn't typically get to experience theater. And and, and it also gives you an opportunity to, to be more creative and being more creative yes. is what we've been asking for. I'm so tired of seeing the same 20 plays get produced all over, over the country. For it, for like, it, for it, for it, yeah. and reaffirming the same like, narratives for it, you know? Yeah. Like, I don't want to, like, I, I got, I had to sit with my friend, um, cause she was, uh, like, she had like a very, very special audition, um, uh, like where she basically had the part, but it was for Book of Mormon and like, she hates Book of Mormon. I hate Book of Mormon. I don't care what anybody has to say about Book yeah. of Mormon. You could take everything you're saying and shove it. Anyway. <laughs> it's funny. I was actually it, just talking. Up your, yeah. <laughs> like there's no justification for the um, uh, representation of um, African people in that. Play Absolutely. At all. Zero. They, you it's can funny. say the white folks are dumb, but there's no, right. there's literally no limit to how, uh, uh, how fucked up they are to, um, the, the the African nation that they're claiming to serve. And don't get me wrong, I'm aware it's supposed to be f- like a, a little fucked up, but the levels to which it's actually fucked up are not even being considered by the white audiences. Yeah. And you're just like, ha ha ha, laughing. Yeah. I didn't, that and, wasn't a joke. Like, what are you yeah. laughing at? And it's because the people at the head of it are known provocateurs who are like in the pocket of corporations like Viacom because well, Viacom owns Comedy Central right. and, and South, South Park but I, yeah. I like you know and my sister for, for instance my sister she's one of the most moderate centrist people you'll ever meet uh-huh. so she goes to see this play with another friend of hers who is even more conservative and they left her friend threw up like it's like she watches South Park regularly so it's it's there's like a whole nother aspect of of like this won't be seen by black people that Mm -hmm. like this play is not this musical rather is not and i'm like going in on book of mormon right now it's just (laughs) oh like like um uh it it just blows my like it blows my mind i've never seen book of mormon i had to hear it from my sister how fucked up it was you know for so long absolutely i was a person who i've i'll yeah i don't fucking care I've come close. I've been the second choice twice for Elder Cunningham, mm-hmm. once on Broadway and once in Australia. It is what it is. And I was talking to my friend a couple of days ago because he was like, yeah, I had to sort of stop my project because it didn't feel right to move forward with it in a time like this. Cause it was mostly about like me and the people involved were like mostly white and it's like should I be telling the story right now I don't think it needs to be heard right now I'm like no you can kind of hear it right now it's just like make space for other people and like we have both been people who have come very close in the you know in the white American theater of being handed primary roles at the age of 22 years old (laughs) like these are things that are just handed to like Jewish kids that like can that can make the cut and like can be funny and shit and I could spend the rest of my life being a funny Jew but at the moment it seems like it would do the world a whole lot good to see like somebody just making space without like even really trying too hard that's the thing about that change right you don't have to try so hard you just have to like like like, you don't don't go out of your way to the point of it being performative but like like i i actually though i i am asking white folks in theater to try hard or like this is this is still not it like i don't want to hear that everyone got the day off on juneteenth because everyone is white people everyone who is in your office are white what like uh, they so they get the day off but then they're gonna go to restaurants where black people of color black people of color are serving food to them they're gonna go to banks black people are working they're gonna go to the post office black people are working you know it's it doesn't it it could be a federal holiday and somehow black people and i'm saying black people specifically because it's juneteenth um are um going to get the blunt end of you know short end of the so, stick. Yeah, they're, the short they're end of the still going to be working. They're not going to be able to celebrate Juneteenth because they yes. have to work. 
good. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. you know, like, how about we deep down and dig in, dig into the narrative of what Dream Team even means? And, and like, I'm, when people were like, oh, it should be the new Independence Day. I'm like, no. The narrative just gets so convoluted, you know, um, to the point where you have people in the Deep South who believe that white people enjoyed slavery and, like, totally loved it, which is where those, like, racist um, uh, uh, medical standards come from, you know, yeah. of, like, docile, happy, you know, Black people working on a uh, plantation. It's so like for a while, it's hard weird. to like indulge, right? It's hard to like indulge joy. But that's like what yes. Jordan Cooper, when he came on. I love Jordan, our, that's my homie. Jordan is fucking phenomenal. Yeah. He is like a phenomenal human to talk to. He is yeah. so smart. And he has his own, like, like you, he actually loves Tyler Perry. One of the things he said is like, I get so much joy when I see Tyler Perry. And he loves a strange loop. Like we could love both. I because, love strange loop. Yeah, we, we're, we're, we're strange Tyler loop <laughs> on this. But what he was saying is that it's clear that a story about uh, that only exploits black trauma is told by a white institution if there's no joy if there's no medicine that comes with that that like ex that gives somebody a whole life not just like you know there's there's comedy and there's tragedy that that's how i i kind of see it and like when they when they join that's like when you see the best work that's when you get a strange loop that's i mean that's when you get a hamilton for for what it's worth <laughs> What is yeah, uh, it's like <laughs> oh, I, I agree fully with like you there's really no way to actually like enjoy like really indulge in it because it's always like wow this is probably sprinkled with like racism or like this still functions as like a tool of white supremacy yeah. like, it's still, like it's it's permeated everything everywhere so many yeah. chances like we've had so many chances as a nation to get it right and there's just been mm -hmm. deliberate choice not to yeah. Um, uh, uh, and a deliberate suppression of the voices who are like, hello, mm -hmm. we have a solution right here. Yeah. You know, um, I, like, I go on YouTube, oh my God, and there's uh -oh. so many old interviews with these radical thought leaders, and I'm just, you know, this is amazing. You know, but at the same time, though, they're going on with the equal and opposite of these, narr of these uh, radical thought leaders who are like, who's like the leader of the KKK, let's talk to both of these, you know, groups, you know, and it's like, why are we validating this, um, but saying that, like, Nazis are bad? Like, we can say Nazis are bad, right. but we're interviewing a platform to right. like, do their, like, anti-racist, homophobic, transphobic right. beliefs. Woo, like, what? Like, no. it's the same thing. Yeah. It's also don't call themselves a Nazi. Yeah, it's just like also embedded in, it's just so embedded in our culture where like, you know, I'm eating a french fry and it's like, wow, this is the only, <laughs> like, yeah. like, like Chick-fil-A, like I'm eating a Chick-fil-A uh -huh. french fry, and like, no, but they're like anti-LGBTQIA. And anti, like, and there can be really anti -black. And anti black so it's like, oh my gosh, like, and I'm I can't even enjoy a french fry without, can you like, a french fry? Yo, I will say that it is really fucking disappointing when Joe Rogan gets no shit for having Alex Jones on twice for four hours. Joe but Renee, you shit get shit the minute, minute the flea posted that. Somebody was like, Renee, what do you have to say? That is, that is, that is white supremacy. The, I, the notion that we don't have to take action. That we don't have to respond. Yeah, that like, yeah, because the, that goes back to that personal responsibility conversation we were just having, where to still put, like, say that like it's on Black people to like pull themselves up by their bootstraps and like get the equity that they need because they've already got everything they need to get that equity is just so misguided and so steeped in like fucking laziness and and and, and like not owning your shit. That's you know what's been like so. It's like encouraging to see though during these last couple of months is that is like the way that I think is like a younger generation how because we are because we prioritize self-care you know and we prioritize like being the best version of ourselves in order to best serve our communities or like to best yeah. show up for the people that we love like there was a lot of room in the conversations that we've been having to say if you are a part of the oppressed community you don't have to do a thing 
Like, mm -hmm. it's okay. It is so okay great. for you to not be on the front lines. Like, take care of yourself. Like, because that's what, that's what they want, right? They want you, they want to tire everyone out. So that way the, so that way the marathon ends. Like, you know, everyone stops running. Like there's no finish line because everyone gets tired. And it's like, no, there's room for everyone in this movement. If you want to stay at home and like, use and like contribute to the movement through graphic design like do that because we need it like social media is a thing like we need beautiful graphics to spread our message right yes. like everyone can contribute in a way that like is best serving who they are and what they and their capacity for participation right um, like and that's oh God, i'm so tired of people just being like judging folks for choosing the the most self uh, uh so, like the most efficient way for them to get engaged it's like like yeah like i didn't i didn't march this year um i marched when i back in 2014 2015 like i did the like the the in person protesting and i said i do not want to engage with um with the cause in that way again i didn't it just wasn't for me. So how am I doing it now? Well, we have Black Girls to Theater. We have social media. We have conversations. Exactly. So if those are my avenues. If those work best for me, then yes. I can only use what's best for me in order to like push this um, push this movement forward. And that's it. And right. leaving for everyone that's to the have convergence that's going to happen. If you're pushing here and I'm pushing there, and you're and this person's pushing there, and and she's doing that, and he's doing, we're all going to converge some point exactly and it's going to solve more problems than just one or or just you know like oh fine we'll give you this but there's a 30-year moratorium on it and you might lose it in 30 years so like exactly keep your community together yeah it's not your responsibility to deal with all this bullshit i completely agree with that mm -hmm. um i feel like i feel like we did it do we do it I feel like we did it. Um, no, I'm kidding. I'm kidding. Um, so just tell everybody where we could find you, Renee. Guys, guys. So you can find me on Instagram at Black Girls Do Theater with the ER ending. Um, I'm joking, y'all. Uh, for like any like inquiries, um, you can reach out to me at Renee at Black Girls Do Theater dot com. And I really want to amplify that because. Um, you know, we are a community. And so if you want a shout out for like a production that you're doing, like reach out to me and we will figure out the best way to do it. And man, we have to, we have to talk about that because that's an enough, uh, an entire thing about like hierarchy, but those two places, um, I also <laughs> find me on, um, my personal Instagram at Renee Chanel Harris. Yeah. I'm looking it up right now. <laughs> I'm going to follow you back girl immediately. Yes. But yeah, those are the three places. So at Black Rose Theater, then Renee at BlackRoseToTheater.com, and then at Renee Chanel Harris. Wonderful. Fuck yeah. Thank you, Renee. Good shit. Bye.